Okay, um, welcome. Welcome to the uh, King's Research Seminar Series. We've got a, a new venue here. We have been over in the um, over in Building 184, Old Microbiology. Um, but I think this lecture theatre also works. We may move between the two um, for those of you that are going to come to these um, regularly. Um, the idea is to have a seminar series that actually showcases what the um, what the, is going on in the faculty in research that is accessible to everybody. So not really um, complex uh, pictures of gels or, or um, tables and tables full of data, etc. But to be a seminar series that's accessible to everybody uh, with an educated mind. So today's speaker is Anna Meredith. Um, Anna joined the university in uh, 2018 as head of Melbourne Veterinary School um, and professor of zoological and conservation medicine. She graduated from the University of Oxford in 1986 with a Bachelor of Arts in Physiological Sciences and then went on to Cambridge University in, um, and uh, graduated in 1991 in veterinary medicine. Um, after graduating in uh, veterinary medicine, Anna took uh, a year to go and uh, work in veterinary practice, and then she went to the University of Edinburgh, the Royal Dick School of uh, Veterinary Studies at the University of Edinburgh, where I first met her, actually, uh, when I was uh, at the University of um, Edinburgh. Anna came into the University of Edinburgh as a lecturer in zoo and laboratory animal medicine, and, head of, and as head veterinary surgeon at Edinburgh Zoo. Edinburgh's got quite a big and rather nice zoo, actually. So I'm sure she got uh, lots of experience there. She gained a PhD in infectious diseases from Edinburgh University and is a European and Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons diplomat and recognized specialist in zoological medicine and wildlife population health. Over the years, she's had a number of roles in management and leadership, but in addition to those, since we're talking about research today, Anna has published um, over 100 scientific journal and textbook publications and has had many other distinguished roles, including as chair of the UK government's Zoo Expert Committee, a member of the Scottish Government Scientific Advisory Council that advises the Scottish Government, and a trustee and council member of the Zoological Society of London, though uh, run the very world famous London Zoo. And earlier this year, um, I'll just embarrass Anna by mentioning that, uh, yet again, that she got an OBE um, in the, one of the Queen's um, honours lists, so well done to her, um, for her services to animal welfare and veterinary profession. Please welcome Professor Anna Meredith. Thank you, John, for that very kind um, and embarrassing introduction. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, so I can assure you there's not a gel in sight uh, or lots of data. I confess, you know, I'm not a hardcore researcher. I'm very much a, a veterinary clinician and teacher. I followed, as, as John had alluded, I've been at the University of Edinburgh for most of my career before I um, made that wonderful transition over here to Australia. Um, and I followed a clinical academic track, but I'm very interested in research. And what I intend to do today in about 45, 50 minutes is give you a bit of a romp through um, some, some of the aspects of my career and the, and the research that I have done. Um, from zoos to zoonosis. Well, this is me um, looking a little bit younger with Anna, the baby tapir. Um, that was about a year after I started at Edinburgh Zoo. Um, and I got to know the keepers very well and was very much involved with the birth of, of this tapir. And they, the keepers decided to name her after me, which is a real badge of honour. They obviously knew I'd been accepted in the zoo um, if they name an animal after you. So as I said, just a bit, a bit of a romp through what I've done and some insight into what a wildlife vet does. Um, and what I want to do by the end of uh, this short lecture is actually convince you that wildlife health is really important. And I'll give you some examples of why it's important. Now, um, John mentioned I've been here just over a year. Um, obviously, I've got to a very busy and challenging um, and hugely enjoyable role as head of school. Uh, but because of that, I haven't actually done any um, active research in Australia. So the examples I'm going to show you today are inevitably based... Um, very much in a Scottish uh, context with Scottish species, but the principles um, and the science is, is the same the world over. So I hope it's, it's relevant um, to, to, um, to what we're talking about today, wildlife health. 
Um, and also, just to say that despite not having had a chance yet to really get my teeth into any wildlife health research in Australia, I have some very big plans. So um, watch this space and hopefully um, in a year or so's time we can, um, we can talk about some actual Australian examples. So I'm very grateful to John and to Glenn. They've really set the scene for One Health. Um, so I'm going to skip over this bit fairly fairly um, quickly because hopefully we're all in, the, in that mindset now. We all embrace One Health. We understand what it's about. It's very complex. Um, but essentially, health connects all species, us as humans, um, animal species, the health um, of the environment, the health of the planet. And um, we're all probably familiar with this triad. It comes around in many forms. But basically, um, although One Health started out really um, as linking human health and animal health, it was started out um, as sort of linked actually between the um, American Veterinary Association and the American Medical Association, uh, looking at that aspect of it, now it embraces um, the healthy environment as well and so so-called ecosystem health, etc. And also on the animal side, although it mainly um, one health, the One Health movement started as mainly you know, domestic animals, livestock, human health, um, obviously we've got a kangaroo there. Wildlife health uh, is an incredibly important part of this um, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. And I think we all know why we're so concerned about One Health. It's we're living in a very changing world with a lot of complex challenges. And putting the pieces of this sort of jigsaw together as to why um, we're in the predicament uh, that we're in today globally, um, it's things like the habitat deterioration. Um, we've got a lot of pollution, and we call, talk about pathogen pollution, as well as, you know, more traditional sorts of pollution with toxins and microplastics, etc. Um, things basically in places that they shouldn't be and causing problems and ill health. We've also got rapid global travel, people and animals and animal products. Uh, everything's moving around the world very quickly and that way we can transmit things like infectious diseases much more quickly than we used to. And that's been an important factor in a lot of the emerging disease outbreaks that we've uh, been experiencing. Increasing urbanisation where we've got dense populations uh, with all the challenges that that uh, faces as well of having to feed and provide sanitation for those dense populations and again increased contact, movement etc. So more likely to be exposed to things like infectious agents um, and obviously um, you know climate change uh, infect, uh, affecting all sorts of aspects of that including things like uh, insect vectors and the way that they can interact with, with pathogens and disease transmission. So a very changing world and a very complex and wicked problems that, that come with that. Now, I don't expect you to read the small text here, but recently, you know, my, my title is I'm a, a professor of zoological and conservation <laughs> medicine. And conservation medicine is a, is a term that's only been really used for about, I suppose, about 20, 20 years now. And um, without going into too much detail, conservation medicine isn't just about treating sick animals that are, um, you know, threatened or, you know, where they have some sort of uh, conservation status. It's really talking about it in its broadest sense. Um, acting at this interface, again, we've got this triad here of, you know, animal diseases, human diseases, and the, the ecosystem functioning. And conservation medicine focuses there. It's not just vets that do conservation medicine. It's not a veterinary speciality. Far from it. It's very interdisciplinary and, and collaborative. So all the things that, that Glenn was talking about today, about interdisciplinary teams and using expertise from across the breadth of sciences and social sciences, um, ecology, industry is so important. But conservation medicine is my area of, uh, of interest and specialization. And I like to think of, um, when you think of medicine, well, medicine's what you practice practice to achieve health. So I like to think of conservation medicine as one of the means, or it's the application of, of practicing uh, one health. So I always believe that, you know, to be successful in your career and enjoy your job, you've got to find your passion, find what really drives you to get out of bed in the morning and, and go and do the work that you do and the research that you do. And um, I've always been passionate about wildlife. I suppose starting off in my career, I was a bit naive. I thought I'd be there sort of darting tigers and, and looking after sick elephants. And, and I've done that. It's been great fun. 
Um, but actually, I'm more concerned in a global sense about what's going on. And what's really brought home to me was, I remember reading this, it was the 2016 report, and I suddenly realised that at that time, it was, uh, it was about the, 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 the figures were relating to basically since I was born. And I think it's very, you know, um, pertinent that just in my lifetime, and, you know, I'm, I'm not that old, I'm getting quite old now, but I'm not that old, but um, there's been a nearly 60% 60, 60 decline in vertebrate species globally. It really is uh, terrifying. Um, we can see this graph here, I hope you can see that, of the, the rate of species extinctions just since 1800, uh, rising exponentially there. And they refer to the current era as the, the Holocene or the Anthropocene, this world that we've got that's so heavily influenced by human uh, factors. And we're, we're living, um, so, so it seems, through what the, what's been termed the sixth mass extinct, extinction. That's occurring now. And there are lots of drivers for that, I've mentioned some of them, but the key threats, as I've outlined in the, the Living Planet report, which comes out regularly, is you know, the habitat loss, species over-exploitation, over-fishing, over-hunting, we've made, already made lots of species extinct, uh, pollution, um, invasive species, we've moved animals uh, all around the world, I think Australia's got some great examples of that, and also disease, and I'm going to be focusing today on, on the disease that affects um, in my uh, uh, situation, wildlife, and of course climate change. So we, we know all about this. And um, John um, and Jody were talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, and this frightening report, again, it's far too small for you to read, but basically I'm sure some of you are aware of this report from the UN um, that came out um, a few weeks ago now, highlighting the actual the, 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 you know, the crisis that we're in. It says at the top, you know, nature's dangerous decline, unprecedented species extinction rates accelerating and a million uh, species, a million species threatened with extinction now. So we are at crisis point and um, as we've mentioned, the sustainable development goals, people are recognising this and it is going to be a, a truly interdisciplinary and global approach to, to addressing some of these uh, key problems. So I mentioned at the beginning, what I want to, to try and convince you is that wildlife health is important <coughs> Uh, why? Well, trying to drill it down in just into, into um, you know, half an hour or so of, of the rest of the lecture. I'm going to talk about wildlife as a source of disease. That's obviously important. Uh, wildlife disease can be transmitted to um, other animals, to domestic animals, uh, but also, very importantly, to humans. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but wildlife are also victims of disease. I'm a wildlife vet, um, and as a veterinarian, I'm more interested, I suppose, in um, treating animals and looking at animals that are, are victims of disease and understanding the disease processes. So we'll be talking about that, and I'll give you some examples from my research. And very importantly, is our animals can, and wildlife can help us. Um, they're very useful sentinels. They can tell us about this world that we're all living in, um, often in a, in a unique way and in a different way and in a very useful way. And, and they can really um, inform us and we can learn a lot from them about uh, the ecosystem in which we're all uh, living and, and the state of its health. So all these things, sources, victims and sentinels, have real implications. Obviously they've got implications for human health, wildlife health, um, human welfare. Um, also though, because they can be victims of disease, the conservation of biodiversity. And I'll give you some examples of how disease is really threatening species and has even caused extinctions. Of course we've got implications for individual animal welfare, which we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't ignore, that's very important. And globally, all these things have implications for economics and global trade. So, as I said, I will just illustrate some of these with examples from, from my own work. And actually, when I'm talking about wildlife health now, we're developing some new um, initiatives um, in, in Australia, for example. Um, myself and the colleagues that I work with in this space, we're looking around for a definition of what, what is wildlife health? What does it mean? What does health mean? There are quite good definitions now of what health means to humans. The WHO has quite a, a good definition of wildlife, uh, sorry, of human health, but there is actually no uh, definition of wildlife health. So um, some colleagues and I tried to 
um, come up with a definition, and this is our sort of working draft of that. So uh, Lee Skerritt, who some of uh, you know, Andy Peters um, from CSU, and Scott Carver, who works at UTAS, um, all of us working in the wildlife One Health uh, space, we came up with this um, in, a, in a proposal to government that we're working on about trying to define wildlife health. So wildlife health isn't all just about diseases. Um, it's really very holistic. It's, uh, you can define it as the phys physical, physiological, behavioural and social well-being of free-ranging animals, both as individuals, as populations, but at the wider ecosystem level. And very importantly in this changing world, um, they're how they cope, they're resilient to change. So I'd welcome any feedback on that, whether you think that's a, a good definition uh, or not. So wildlife as source of disease, just a bit of more background on that. Well, um, one report has, has, has collated all the known sort of human pathogens. It's probably been updated a bit since then, but roughly about 1,400 human bugs or disease, you know, pathogens that you can get that can cause disease. And actually over 60% of them are zoonotic. 60% of them can come from animals. Um, and of the emerging infectious diseases um, that are that are you know that have emerged in, in the recent uh, decades, um, three quarters of them are, are zoonotic and mainly originating for wildlife. And this seems to be increasing. So don't worry too much about a graph. I think this is one of the very few graphs I'm showing. But the white bits there are zoonotic diseases from wildlife. So you can see the white bar is is increasing over the decades. Um, so from about four, between 1940 and 2000, about 40% of uh, emerging diseases were coming from wildlife. Now it's um, over 52%. Over so the wildlife um, element and wildlife as sources of disease seems to be getting bigger. Why is that? Well, it's this global, global drivers of change, the changing world. We're coming into ever increasing contact. Uh, with wildlife because we're encroaching on, on their space, if you like, their habitat, um, and, and lots of other reasons as well. So just some examples there. You might think, oh, that's just, just a dead crow. Does it matter? Well, birds are one of the uh, hosts of West Nile virus, and actually dead crows were one of the first um, indicators that West Nile virus was, was uh, uh, sweeping across the United States. And actually, it was a zoo vet, Tracy McNamara, that first picked up this uh, in, in, in crows um, and gave us some idea that, that, that an outbreak was happening. Um, I love this picture. This is obviously from the UK, where tuberculosis in, in cattle is a big problem. Um, and badgers are one of the main reservoirs. And this is a great picture, and it is indicating that you know you've got this this transmission route from badgers to cattle. Actually, what nobody tells you is this is actually a stuffed badger. It's not a real <laughs> badger, but it's a great it's a great picture. Um, and we've got some species that seem to be sort of super reservoirs, and um, it's been proven now that bats really do harbour more dangerous viruses than any other species. They don't get sick with them themselves, but they are the source of, um, amongst other things, all these um, diseases that I've li uh, listed here. Some of you, have, I'm sure, are very familiar with these things like Ebola, SARS, MERS, Nipper, Hendra, etc. So obviously wildlife is a really important reservoir. Now, I say they don't cause a problem to the, to the bats, but uh, for various reasons, we're coming into contact uh, with bats, um, either directly or via their contact with domestic animals. Um, so we're getting those, tr opening up new transmission routes and opportunities for pathogens to jump the species um, than ever before. And when you get that perfect storm of events where uh, a pathogen can jump, say, from a, from a bat to a pig to a human, as was the case with Nipah virus, that's when we can get um, outbreaks occurring. It's not the bat's fault. Um, so wildlife surveillance is really, really important. And obviously that's a key part of when you're dealing with wildlife health. And actually, it's, thank goodness, it's increasingly being recognised. It used to be thought, thought of that wildlife was somehow separate. It was the, the, the domain of biologists and ecologists and, and really, you know, human uh, medics and, and you know, uh, livestock vets, they weren't really bothered about wildlife. Now, as I say, there's increasing global recognition of the importance of wildlife health. Um, and you can read that quote, um, I won't read it out, but obviously surveillance of wildlife disease is really, really important and equal in status to domestic animals. Um, and I mentioned sentinels, it's recognised that um, by the OIE, the OIE is basically the world body of, of animal health, um, uh, that, um, that, that wildlife can act as sentinels. 
But I mentioned, you know, as a zoo vet and having, having spent my, most of my career um, uh, being a vet for, for animals, wildlife are also victims of disease. And it's very well established now that, that disease is one of the causes of extinctions. Yes, habitat loss and degradation, um, etc., and over-exploitation and invasive species, of course, really strong drivers. But often disease, especially when you've got diminished populations, is often, if you like, the last, the, the straw that breaks the camel back. It can come into a small population, particularly they're more at risk, um, and, and cause extinctions. And some of you might have heard of this fungal disease of amphibians called chytrid, chytridiomycosis. That has been um, uh, described as the greatest disease cause loss of biodiversity in recorded history. And it's caused extinctions of many uh, species of frogs. In, um, in, it's been, uh, it's, it occurs in Australia and in the Americas. Um, causing disease. It's been introduced, we think, by people um, from, from areas of the world where it, it occurs naturally in amphibians and doesn't cause uh, mass declines. But it's a great, great example of a, of a disease that can cause extinctions. And then there's another example, the parchula snail. And I put this on because I used to look after parchula snails as part of my job at Edinburgh Zoo. It was one of the species that Edinburgh Zoo was... Um, uh, involved in captive breeding of and conservation of. And actually zoos, this is a great example of where a zoo can save a species, not just Edinburgh Zoo, but the global zoo community. Uh, Parchula snails went extinct in the wild. They come from Tahiti or Fr French Polynesia. And it's a classic example of how things go wrong and people mess things up. So the Parchula snail is the native snail. Um, people introduced the African land snail, the giant land snail, to Tahiti to eat as a food source. And then it got out of hand, um, and they started, so they introduced a, um, a parasitic snail to eat the, Jaf uh, the African land snails. Um, it was called the rosy wolf snail, I think. But the rosy wolf snail decided it didn't like eating the African giant land snail, the introduced species. It, it preferred the tasty little native snails and ate all of those, so they, they actually went extinct. But luckily we had... Um, uh, sort of arc populations in zoo. But actually, in these very small, uh, small populations, the last thing that killed the last few um, snails of some of the species was a microsporidian parasite that actually uh, uh, killed the last remaining individuals. Um, so that's just another example. And then, of course, there are diseases that aren't infectious. I am going to be concentrating on infectious disease today, but there are non-infectious diseases that can cause massive uh, population declines and even extinctions. And uh, not quite extinctions, but many species of vultures in Africa. Um, you can see a whole pile of dead vultures here. This was caused by a veterinary drug that was being used in cattle uh, in, in India. And um, the carcasses uh, were left out in the open. If they died, the vultures came and ate the carcasses, and they died of kidney failure through eating this drug uh, accidentally as, as part of the carcass. It was in the carcass. Uh, it was called diclofenac. So other things as well, lead poisoning. So we, we, we consider it a non-infectious disease as well. And I said there are other impacts, just some more examples of here, where disease um, is very well established as a cause of population decline. So disease itself is threatening biodiversity. And there's many examples there. The one at the top is a squirrel with squirrel pox. I'll be talking to you more about red squirrels uh, and a new disease that we found in them. But there's lots of other examples here. Um, even bees, um, disease is one of the factors causing uh, this, this catastrophic loss of, of honeybees. Um, called colony collapse. It's a combination of a parasite, a virus, and also the toxins that we've put into the environment. So lots of examples. And in Australia, um, uh, citizen beak and feather disease um, can cause uh, you know, a real threat to particularly endangered species of, of parrot, like the orange-bellied parrot, etc. And now you all know about Ebola. Now, we think of Ebola, you know, it's all across the media, as a, as, and it's obviously a very real problem in humans and causing... Um, a, a real uh, concern globally um, in terms of human disease. Um, but actually, many of you, um, were any of you aware of this? That actually Ebola's wiped out a third of the world's great apes. So another example here about how disease can, can have real impact on biodiversity. And they can be both source and victim. So here's an, uh, an, an illustration from, um, from Australia. We've got a possum here with horrible lesions on it. Um, this is Beruli ulcer, or Bairnsdale ulcer, caused by a mycobacterium. So um, 
Possums are affected by it. Humans are affected by it. Uh, we're not exactly sure of the of the uh, exact um, you know disease transmission cycle here, but here you've got an example of disease uh, affecting the animal itself as a welfare problem with this poor possum. Um, but also it uh, has implications for human health. And those badgers with TB, we're concerned mainly because um, it affects the cattle trade in, in the UK particularly. New Zealand's got a similar problem or had a similar problem. Um, and you've got a wildlife reservoir. But it also caused problems for the poor badgers as well. They get horrible disease with tuberculosis. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've got individual animal welfare. So um, it's not always infectious disease, but we have uh, a, an example here of toxicity. Uh, this is a, an introduced grass that's very widely used in agriculture in, in Australia, but it's, uh, under certain conditions, it's toxic to kangaroos. And this poor kangaroo here, it'll be staggering, um, blind, etc. Uh, real welfare problems there. And also um, things like mange in koalas and wombats. Again, you've got a serious um, individual animal welfare uh, issue here, as well as the obvious uh, disease impacts. So as a vet, um, basically, as a vet, we're, we're mainly trained, um, when, when you're training to, to deal with animals, um, mainly the emphasis has been traditionally on, on the individual. Uh, but really, when we're talking about certainly wildlife uh, medicine and uh, conservation medicine, we're talking about dealing with um, populations and indeed ecosystems. So I've said I've, I've had a very varied career, you know, operating on gorillas and, and dealing with uh, wildlife rescue, etc., uh, where you're dealing with individual animals. And that primary post is mainly about the individual animal welfare. More importantly, though, um, even in a zoo situation, in captive situations, we're dealing with populations and population health because that's what's going to be important for, for example, reintroductions. And I mentioned the parchula snail. It's the health of the, of, the pot, of the colony here. I spent many a happy day every day uh, at the zoo, probably for 17 years, looking after penguins because we had a very large penguin colony there. Um, and sometimes just dealing with individuals but with a population um, focus, so for example, controlling reproduction. And I don't know if you can see this image. It's, a very, it's very difficult to find pictures of yourself actually doing veterinary work, but um, this is me here, and this is obviously a polar bear. Um, and that was about six months after I'd first graduated. Um, and um, I was asked to vasectomize the polar bear, um, which was the first for me. And I, I have to say, I've never done one again, but um, it, was, it was actually pretty simple. It was just like vasectomizing any other species. So it's a good example of how you can use your basic principles on any animal, be it a polar bear or a sheep or a dog. Um, but before I get on to the um, research examples, then... Um, Wildlife health and practice mainly, uh, and conservation medicine, is, is talking about populations and ecosystems. And there's lots of things we can do. We can, um, when we're doing research, a lot of it is just gathering more information, which is very important. Um, we can do surveillance, which I've mentioned the importance of, particularly if you're um, monitoring for specific diseases or problems, for example, swabbing uh, frogs here for that fungal disease I mentioned. Uh, or it might just be what we call passive surveillance, just keeping a watching brief and a watching um, brief of, of what's going on um, in a particular population or area. And then, of course, we can intervene. We can carry out interve interventions. And I was really glad to hear uh, Glenn mentioning the fact that it's not just about getting the basic information. It's actually about doing something about it um, and acting on that information, translating it, applying it uh, for practical solutions. And that's something I'm particularly interested in. It's very multidisciplinary and it's very collaborative. And it's not just vets. Vets just play a small role in these multidisciplinary uh, teams. But we do have an important role um, as vet veterinarians in this, um, in this space. So moving on to some examples then. The first one is, is example from my, from my PhD. Um, I did a PhD. I mentioned um, I'm a clinician teacher and I actually did a PhD quite late on in my, in my career. Um, and I was looking as wildlife as sentinels. Now, um, there are lots of ways you can use sentinels. Probably um, the most famous or obvious one is the canary down the mine, where we can use animals to tell us about the environment, tell us what's going on. In this case, we used animals to warn us that there was something really nasty out there and it might kill us, okay? And you could, you could use that analogy with some of these infectious diseases that we're talking about. And basically, it's one form of surveillance. It's not very sophisticated. It just tells you if something's there or it's not, or maybe if it's there in higher concentrations or higher amounts or not. So it's about obtaining information about presence absence rather than very specific um, 
details upon, uh, uh, about that. And the idea is that if you use sentinels, you might be able to pick up a, a problem before it occurs and do, still have time to do something about it. And we know that several emerging human epidemics were actually identified mm -hmm. first in animals, but no one did anything about it. So, for example, Ebola, we knew about that in primates. Uh, gorillas were dying, chimps were dying, um, and dikers, which is a little sort of forest uh, antelope. So I was working on sentinels and using animals as sentinels, and this is, don't worry too much about this diagram, it's just to say that with colleagues uh, and a team that I was working with at, uh, at Edinburgh, we developed a, a sort of framework for how you could start to think about using animals as sentinels. And there's no one animal that makes a good sentinel, it depends on the species, it depends on the disease that you're interested in, the pathogen, and the effect that it has. But you need to consider all of those things if you want to choose a way of looking for a particular disease or problem and using a sentinel to, to help you with that. And there's lots of examples. I'll just give you some. Um, we know, for example, that our pet dogs can be used as sentinels. There's lots of studies around the world that show us that dogs basically sample the environment for us. A lot of these diseases... They might be in a rodent reservoir, they might be transmitted by insect vectors, and those vectors will bite the dog, and the dog might eat the, ra the rats that are carrying the disease, or whatever it is. Um, and they can actually tell you. So if you took a blood sample from a dog in a village in you know, central Thailand, um, it's got antibodies to avian influenza. So you know that you've got avian influenza in that, pop in that area of population. Uh, if that's what you're interested in. And there are some other examples there. All of these diseases down the left are, are um, uh, human, uh, human pathogens as well as um, causing problems or potentially problems or reservoirs in, 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 um, in animals. Um, so I would look, my PhD was focused around carnivores, wild carnivores uh, in the UK. So we haven't got very exciting wild carnivores. We've killed them all, um, bears and wolves and things like that. But we have got foxes um, still. And uh, we've also got um, domestic cats that, that go out hunting and, so, and are in the environment. So I wanted to use carnivores. And, and we were rationalising. Um, I was working with um, a wonderful lady called Sarah Cleveland at the time. Uh, we were in a group together. And we were looking at carnivores, and we looked at the numbers of zoonotic diseases um, uh, that you can get, and we looked at about 800 of those, and also the numbers of emerging diseases. And you can see there, just in red, that if you look at wildlife, um, they can get a lot of zoonoses, and they can, they can um, harbour a lot of uh, emerging diseases. But carnivores, of all the groups, if you break them down into birds, carnivores, rodents, marine mammals... Um, they, um, they carry the most, okay? They, they can be affected by the, the most. So they seemed a good candidate. I will say I was excluding bats at this point. Um, why do we, why could we use them? Well, they've got, they, they're susceptible or can carry those diseases. But also, the great thing about a lot of these carnivores, things like uh, foxes, and uh, we've got the example there of the fox, which is the one I used, is that they can... Basically, if, if, they're, if they're exposed to a lot of these pathogens, um, these bugs, they can, they can develop antibodies to them, but they don't get sick. So they continue living, and they can basically tell you what's going on over time, and they can sort of accumulate, if you like, disease over time, and I'll tell you more about that. And also, a lot of those pathogens, those diseases, can be transmitted by eating. So carnivores eat things, obviously, and they eat other animals. Um, many of which might have a disease that you're interested in. So a lot of the pathogens that I was interested in can be transmitted by eating. And also, as I said, they don't um, make them sick. And we think that's an adaptation to a scavenging or carnivorous lifestyle. So they're sort of adapted to not, not get sick, if you like. And the other thing is that they, because this fox might eat, you know, 10 rabbits a day, you know, and it might live three or four years. That's a lot of rabbits. It's sampled for you. So it, it's doing your work for you. Um, and also the interesting thing as well, there's a lot of evidence now to suggest that predators, whether it's a lion hunting a, a, a wildebeest they'll, they'll, or a fox hunting a, a rabbit, they will preferentially select the ones that are uh, um, sick. Uh, makes sense. They're probably easier to kill. Um, and there's also um, evidence that the the prey animals behave differently and are, um, are more likely to get predated on. So there's this process called bioaccumulation. I mentioned about um, these carnivores sampling the, the population for you. Um, 
over time, um, it's, we tend to use it with, with contaminants, but over time um, they can accumulate uh, particular um, uh, contaminants. Um, but we can also use this with, with infectious disease. So, for example, PCBs and things in the environment, we know that, but we were doing a proof of principle about infectious disease. And the idea is, very simply, that if you have a disease in your prey um, at quite a low prevalence, there's lots of these animals, but not many of them are infected, um, that will accumulate up, up, up the, the triangle, if, up the pyramid, if you like, so it's easier to find it in scavengers. And there's been some evidence for this. So, for example, in... Um, in the uh, United States, they kill coyotes, they're a pest animal, but uh, the coyotes eat the deer, and the deer have got TB. So they were using coyotes as sentinels for bovine TB, and it was much easier. You had to sample a lot less coyotes than deer if you wanted to detect uh, TB in an area. So just to summarise that, before I move on to the other diseases, um, this is actually it's a bit depressing. This is my whole PhD in one slide. Um, <laughs> So all that work, just for one slide. So I looked at predators, uh, foxes and cats, and I looked at the things that they ate. So bank voles, field voles, and wood mice. And I did a very detailed study of, of over three sites over three years. And I selected three sort of principal pathogens um, just to prove this concept, which was Q fever, leptospirosis, and another parasite that can cause neurological disease in humans and animals called E. caniculi. You don't need to worry about that. These are potentially zoonotic diseases. And yes, we did prove that the prevalence um, in predators was significantly higher than in the prey animals of all these um, uh, zoonotic pathogens, and also it was about 400 times more effective to sample the predators rather than the prey, because I didn't need to sample as many of those. And then we're using the similar sort of principle now in Scotland for an ongoing project um, on the um, highlands and islands looking at raptors, raptors as an indicator of ecosystem health, both looking at infectious disease but also um, contaminants, pesticides, residues, etc., uh, even antibiotics in the environment that we're testing um, all these um, raptors for. And we're using that tool to inform conservation measures, such as um, we're reintroducing golden eagle chicks now to the south of Scotland, where they've gone extinct or aren't doing very well, um, from the north of Scotland. So a very useful tool. Um, so... The other thing I really wanted to tell you about was red squirrels. Um, red squirrels um, are a particular passion of mine. I've spent um, most of my working life working, studying red squirrels. Um, and they're an iconic Scottish species, obviously. And they're endangered, so they're of conservation interest. Um, and the main problem uh, in Scotland is we've got an invasive alien. Um, so you've got a lot of examples here in, in Australia. The grey squirrel introduced into the UK is listed as one of the hundred of the world's worst invasive alien species. And looking at that map of the UK there, you can see the red, red squirrel and the grey's grey squirrel. And I think you can see that over the last um, 60 years or so, the, the red squirrels have been driven out by the, the grey squirrel. And the remnant population is now in Scotland. And basically that's due to competition. The, the grey squirrels are bigger, North American, they're a bit more sort of aggressive. And, uh, but they also carry a disease. Um, and this is a really good example of the, the, the native species in its native land that carries a disease um, without any problems. So the grey squirrel carries a virus called squirrel pox virus. It doesn't cause any problems to grey squirrels at all. Um, but it kills red squirrels. And in the presence of the disease... The extinction or the decline of red squirrel populations is 20 times greater than if the disease wasn't there. So with the grey squirrel, um, uh, you know, it might be um, a rate of, I don't know, one, so, if you, so the rate's one, but with grey squirrel and the disease, it's 20 times. So I've been doing red squirrel surveillance for a lot of many years, and I spend my life out in the Scottish Highlands, where I don't anymore, because I'm in Australia now, which is great. I don't have to do this and get bitten by midges. Um, sampling, <laughs> sampling and anaesthetising um, and sampling uh, uh, red squirrels, but also we've been doing a lot of passive surveillance. So any dead squirrel in Scotland basically gets sent uh, to, to the University of Edinburgh. And we've, we've found out a lot of new things, including some, a lot of new disease. So, yes, we can do the surveillance for squirrel pox virus, and sure enough, we, followed, we monitored that and, and uh, were very able to track it uh, entering into Scotland, and we were able to record that because we were doing active surveillance. But I wanted to tell you about some new disease. So we did also find other new diseases, 
Um, and that just shows the value of surveillance, looking for what you don't know is there or yet. So we found a new adenovirus, a new rotavirus, a new disease, uh, all these things that you find if, that if you wouldn't find if you weren't looking. But I wanted to tell you about a particular disease that, um, that we came across recently, because this is just an interesting story, and the story is still going on, and it's about leprosy. Um, so just a little bit of background about leprosy, because as a vet, I was certainly never taught about rep leprosy, because it's not an animal disease, is it? Um, well, that's what I was taught. Uh, it's a human disease. We all know about lepers and leper colony, and you know that language is still in our in existence about you know being ousted and ostracised because uh, because of, of having leprosy. Basically, there's two organisms: Mycobacterium leprae and Lepromatosis is a is a newer one um, discovered in Mexico, and it's a difficult bug. Basically, it's difficult to grow. Well, you can't grow it. Um, it's very adapted to humans. It's a human disease, or so we thought until until recently, um, mainly anyway, and obviously it was rife in the Middle Ages and uh, uh, in, even in Britain, but it disappeared. We haven't had leprosy in the UK for many centuries now. And there's different forms, and as you can see here, it's a horrible disease. Now, there are some animals that can get leprosy, and one's the nine-banded armadillo, um, and they're actually used as a model um, for that. And actually what they've found, to cut a long story short, is that basically armadillos were infected by European settlers moving to, to the Americas. So it was an anthropogenic infection, so it's from humans to animals. Um, and recently there have been actual cases of humans getting leprosy from armadillos, because people in California and Texas where they have armadillos, they actually go out and kill them and eat them, and they're getting leprosy from the animals now. So it's a really interesting story. But this was the story with the squirrels. Basically, it was just a few cases over, over, over about six or seven years. We had six cases of this weird disease where they had swellings and lumps and bumps. And um, I just thought, I've not seen this before. This looks really interesting. They all look the same. Um, swollen ears, swollen uh, muzzle, hair loss, etc. And don't worry about this. It's just you know, pink blobs on a screen, but basically if we looked under the microscope, we could find lots of bacteria in there, and these looked like mycobacteria, they were what we call acid fast, they picked up a particular stain. And this, to cut a long story short, was, was leprosy. Um, so linking up with um, colleagues at the, at the Mordun Institute and other colleagues um, in the WHO leprosy lab in Switzerland, uh, we investigated this, and basically we found that in Scotland this was Mycobacterium lepromatosis, which has never been recorded in animals before, um, and only in humans, and only discovered actually, or, or recognised in 2008. And it caused a lot of fuss at the time, because these squirrels have got, have got leprosy, and everyone was very concerned about the poor squirrels, because um, it's a pretty horrible disease. And actually looking back, then people started to send me lots of pictures, so you can see, I hope you can see from the back, but all these squirrels have got these very typical lesions, uh, swollen eyes, swollen sw around the eyes, swollen ears, swollen muzzle. Um, so it's pretty easy to spot. Once you know what you're looking for, you can actually look at a squirrel and say, that's got leprosy, and you're usually right. And then um, a member of the public actually sent me this picture from Brown Sea Island. And Brown Sea Island is a little island at the bottom of... Of, the, of England, it's one of the, the remnant populations of red squirrels. And they said, do you think this is leprosy? I've heard about it on the news. Um, do you think this is leprosy? And I looked at, took one look at that and I said, mm, yeah, that looks like leprosy to me. Um, it's absolutely uh, characteristic. This tiny little island, it's only about a mile long. Um, and actually we went down there, met them, looked around the island and everywhere there were squirrels with leprosy. Um, and actually looking at the reports, it had been there since the 1970s, this weird lumpy disease that they were describing. So it wasn't anything new at all, just no one had ever really investigated it before. And I, good, being good rangers, because it's run by a, a, the National Trust, they'd kept all the bodies and um, I took them back to, to, to Edinburgh and, and looked at them. And sure enough, out of 25 dead squirrels, all of them were positive for the leprosy bacterial, bacterium and about a third of them had these horrible, horrible lesions. Um, and they were the same. Now, the interesting thing was that on Brown Sea Island, it was leprae, and on, um, in Scotland, it was lepromatosis, but I, they looked identical clinically. I mean, we, this was the paper we published in Science. We looked at the outbreak and, um, uh, and did, did some sequencing, etc. And basically, um, just to summarise that, in Scotland the, and Ireland, where red squirrels were reintroduced, it was lepromatosis, and on Brown Sea Island, it was leprae. So really interesting finding. Um, and again, don't worry about this, but basically looking at the sort of genetics of it, um, 
and the phylogeny. Basically, there's two, um, in, with lepromatosis, which is on the left, that's the Mexican one, if you like, that was found in Mexico. There's two distinct lineages, and the squirrel one, it looked like it diverged from the human one about 27,000 years ago. Um, and the British and Irish strains only diverged about 200 years ago, which is consistent um, with when the squirrels were, were reintroduced back into Ireland. So they, th that tells us that they already had it when they were reintroduced into, into Ireland, back into Ireland. And lepre, the, um, the, uh, the strains, the two closest strains to the Brown Sea Island ones, which are there, the, the, the BRW, uh, were human ones. And actually, interestingly, the, 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 most, the closest match was a human medieval skeleton from Winchester, um, that was, uh, they, they isolated the DNA, uh, the leprosy DNA from the bones of the skeleton. And Winchester was where I was born and brought up, so it's, a, it's, a, a, it's close to home. Interesting link. And this has been really interesting because it tells us more about these weird mycobacteria that cause leprosy. And basically, we now know that leprosy is capable of infecting at least three hosts. That's humans, armadillos, and now red squirrels. And the actual best explanation that it was human to animal transmission and we're doing ongoing studies. What we're doing now is actually following live squirrels with leprosy over time um, and looking at how the disease progresses, both from the um, animal's interest, but what it can tell us about human leprosy um, and doing all sorts of tests, um, including we can, we can look at the antibodies they raise and we've validated a, t a serological test in these squirrels. And just, just showing that you can catch the same squirrel twice. We put microchips in them, and then we catch them every six months. I've had a PhD student working on this. Um, and monitor them. We can take little biopsies from the ears. So monitor the live squirrels, whereas previously we, had to, we were only looking at dead squirrels. And we're looking at the, um, the serological changes as well. And so far, you think, well, why on earth red squirrels? I haven't got the answer to that question. So we have looked at other reservoirs. We've looked at grey squirrels, chipmunks. This is a palace squirrel and, and wood rats in Mexico, thinking of them. They're, they're, are there other rodent reservoirs? Well, well so far, no. Um, it's only red squirrels in the UK. So, you know, what does this mean? Well, we don't really know, but what we have shown is that we've got this wildlife reservoir of disease, source of potential source of disease, um, many centuries after it's been cleared from the, from the humans. Um, and also, did, is it like the armadillos? Did the, hu did the squirrels then reinfect humans? Because we, people, believe it or not, did used to eat red squirrels in the, in the UK. And it may be an, a, a, a reason why leprosy is still, there's still about 250,000 cases of human leprosy every year. It's still an endemic disease problem, particularly in India, uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, and it may explain, if there is a, some wildlife reservoir out there, why um, we're not able to get rid of leprosy in the world, despite very effective antibody, antibiotic treatment. Leprosy is a very treatable uh, disease. Is it a zoonosis? Well, we haven't proved that. We haven't had cases of human leprosy on Brown Sea Island. They're all a bit worried now. Um, and we had to do a, a big um, sort of health exercise with Public Health England. We actually did a risk assessment, and, and cu the current evidence says the risk is probably low. But it might have implications, obviously, for red squirrel conservation and management. So just a few more examples before I, before I finish, because it's, um, it's 10 to 2. Um, just again to emphasise that wildlife health and surveillance can, can bring up new things. This was another new, completely new disease that we found on the island of Rummy. identified a new parasite uh, called Amphibiothecum, a sort of um, uh, little intracellular parasite causing horrible disease. This is a tiny little palmate newt um, and mass mortalities um, on the island of Rum. Um, and we've identified that um, and have got ongoing studies looking at why this has occurred on this remote Scottish island where there are no other amphibians. There aren't any other frogs or newts or anything there. Um, these these uh, newts um, have, have developed this, this disease. So there's another interesting story but that, behind that one, but I haven't got time to tell you that. And then, of course, the famous Scottish wildcat, the carnivore. Um, this, now you might think that just looks like a domestic moggy. It, it's not. We're very, very... Um, um, you know, committed to these cats. They are our last remaining carnivore. And the worst case scenario is there's only about 35 left. They're sometimes called the Highland tiger. They're more endangered than real tigers. Um, and the main problem um, is hybridisation with domestic cats. So I've been involved, um, and my team at Edinburgh are still involved very much with looking at um, the conservation of the wild cat. I don't have time to do 
do them justice, but they are a massi uh, massively iconic and much loved species. And I think this is a really good example. Don't worry about the, the just there's a long list there, and that's all the partners that need to get involved in conservation medicine. The veterinary is one part of that. We're one partner. We work with land managers, government, um, all sorts of other agencies, uh, the, the gamekeepers, the landowners, etc., um, to bring about conservation of a species. So it's a truly um, trans and multidisciplinary um, uh, exercise. And we're doing a lot of work identifying where the remaining populations are, if there are any. It's rather depressing news um, because basically we didn't find a single wild cat that didn't have at least some domestic cat DNA in it. There's a hybrid swarm and what we've had to do is, is, is um, basically decide which ones are pure enough to save um, and which ones um, aren't. And uh, the only thing that's going to save them, according to a recent um, project that we've done is actually breeding in captivity um, and creating havens for them where we eliminate feral cats. So it's a massive um, problem. But um, these are some of the things that, uh, that we do to try and save a species. Um, and as uh, the veterinary team involved, obviously, with um, doing the practical work, the veterinary work, but also looking, I was looking at the impact of disease on the wildcats because we knew nothing about it. And obviously they're interacting with domestic cats and a lot of domestic feral cats carry disease. And just a brief overview of that, uh, some, the results of some of that work, looking at dead animals and live animals, was that, yes, we were looking at the feral cat population and the wild cats and the good hybrids. And it's a very worrying picture because all these cat diseases, things like fel feline AIDS, basically, FIV, feline leukaemia, um, cat flu, um, and other diseases, very high prevalence in the feral cats, um, but also... Uh, in the wild cat. So there's obvious disease transmission. And why is that worrying? Well, we know that, for example, FELV, a feline infectious disease, um, has been instrumental in, in a, a population crash of the endangered Iberian lynx. So it is a, it is a real threat to, to endangered cat populations. Um, so that's, again, an ongoing study. And then the whole One Health concept, um, so we can use in other ways, um, when we look about health, um, we reintroduced recently the beaver to, back to Scotland after being extinct since the 1700s. They are, are, now, they are now officially um, you know, back on the books. We had a five-year reintroduction um, and they had to get government approval that we, they could stay after five years. Uh, they are breeding. Um, so we did a huge amount of work in the One Health space, not just to, to make sure the beavers themselves were healthy, and we, these were Norwegian beavers that we reintroduced, but obviously we wanted to make sure that they didn't introduce a new disease to the UK. They're rodents and they can carry lots of nasty diseases, so we want, didn't want to introduce um, pathogens that could affect livestock or humans, potentially, in that area. And also we were um, worried about the the ecosystem. They are e true ecosystem engineers, beavers. But I'm glad to say it all went very well. And um, I say we've, we've published on that now of using this sort of a One Health monitoring approach, it's called, or a One Health surveillance program. So um, that, I said, was a very rapid romp, just to give you a flavour of, uh, of some of the work I've been involved on. And I hope I've convinced you, uh, using those examples, that wildlife health is really important um, as sources um, victims and sentinels. Um, I'd like to thank the huge number of people um, that I've worked with over the years, too numerous to mention. I just I, I started putting acknowledgements together and it was just too too big. But obviously, everyone I've worked with over my, over my career, I couldn't have done any of this uh, without the wonderful teams I work with and still continue to work with. So, so thank you for your interest and attention. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Anna, thank you very much. You've taken us from the general to a couple of specifics there. I think we have time for um, a couple of questions. But while you're thinking about questions, I'll just uh, ask the first one. Um, but you can be thinking about questions over there as well. Um, who's responsible for our wildlife? I mean, in the state of Victoria or in the country of Australia or indeed in Scotland? Um, in Scotland, it's a bit more simple. Um, we have Scot Scottish National Heritage, and they have got a very clear remit for the health um, and welfare um, and conservation of Scottish uh, wildlife. Um, in Australia, it's, it's a bit more challenging when it comes to, especially to the health of the wildlife. And um, without going into too many details, we actually had a workshop on this last week. Um, okay. Department okay. of Environment, Department of Agriculture, 
um, etc. There are there are conflicting areas of responsibility, and I'm unfortunately, to put it very briefly, often wildlife health. If something goes wrong, if they're sick, it falls between between the cracks. There's other people who've also got a lot of expertise in this area um, in the audience, but um, it's it's not clear. Okay. The Department of Ag um, is more interested with, with where it influences livestock health. Um, you know, Department of Environment, where there's an emergency, but the sort of background health is is not quite as clear cut. Okay. Questions? Yeah, please. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, I just thought you, um, or if you could comment on your perspective, um, comparing your experiences in the UK versus what you think Australia uh, is like at the moment in terms of wildlife disease and where we're lacking, or maybe where we're, we've got some advantages? Um, that's a very good question and a very big question. Um, <laughs> and obviously, I'm, you know, I wouldn't want to presume anything because I am new to the field, but I have been working and talking to a lot of people in this space, and I'm on the, on the Board of Wildlife Health Australia and learning, learning a lot there. I think um, there are unique challenges here, just the scale of things um, and the amount of invasive species. Um, I think you have good relationships with government and close relationship with governments, and that's similar in the UK, or certainly in Scotland it's much better than England, and I think that's a real advantage to have those direct links. Um, my perspective is actually is the essential problems are the same. Um, I think the disadvantages of being so big and with your f um, you know, federal system makes it much more challenging in terms of communication and a joined up approach. The GB, we have some of those issues. In, in, in Great Britain, we've got the Great British, um, the GB Wildlife Health Surveillance Scheme, but because we're physically smaller, it makes life a little bit easier. It doesn't overcome all the challenges, but I think size and scale is probably your main, your main challenge. Other questions? Yeah, please, welcome. And I'm just wondering if you've made comments on maybe some of the ethical and environmental impacts of both reintroduction of species such as these which are Scotland again, red, red screw of into Ireland two hundred years ago. And maybe even some of the things that we're thinking about now, such as using more bacteria to eliminate vectors or gene drives to eliminate vectors, I mean they're having an impact on all these that uh, have a mission in I think it's more than one PhD uh, thesis. The sort of ethical issues. I think, I think, I suppose my overarching feeling is that you know we we never seem to learn from our previous mistakes. We're still making the same mistakes over and over again of moving animals around, reintroducing them without thinking about the other things. It's not just. You know, people can, for example, if you're talking about conservation, you can get very focused on the actual species and restoring that species without thinking about the disease implications and the, the genetic implications and the other impacts. So I think we're getting better at it. And there are, you know, global guidelines now of having to do things the right way when you're doing translocations. But um, we're not good enough yet. And I don't think uh, we consider those other factors enough. We're getting better um, and I think the whole sort of One Health awareness and approach and these multidisciplinary teams can only strengthen that, that approach. Um, that's not a very good answer because I think it's a massive, a massive topic that we probably haven't got time to talk about All right. today. Different question over at the back. Um, perhaps on a similar, somewhat philosophical thread, at the beginning you introduced the definition of what That's a very good point. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll take that on on board. Yes, the, the term wild actually is really, um, it, it, it's losing its meaning because there is no true wild really anymore. I mean, I don't think there's any point on the planet that's not untouched in some way by, by human influence. I suppose 
Um, and people use sort of managed now or, you know, free living managed or, but, um, but yes, very good point. And maybe we could reflect that better in that definition. Um, but I don't think, I think this is something that people who work with wildlife are learning much more and more that um, working with conservation reintroductions, you, you can't just, conservation actually is, is probably another mis misnomer because conservation means it's, it, it smacks of preservation of, you know, not, still moving forward, going back to how well, conserving something as it was, which is also naive. Um, so um, those terms, I think we all know what they mean, but they actually perhaps don't mean what they originally meant. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, you that you outlined that the biggest threat to wildlife health is human behaviour. Um, where do you see the discipline confronting that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the discipline of one health. I mean, I suppose as it's broad its sense, it's, it's that um, is, is involving different disciplines, so bringing in the social sciences and things that, and the, the expertise that we need to actually have tools and education and information that would inform human behaviour and ultimately that's going to go back to in, in many um, in many situations it's going to back to 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 policy and 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 governmental drivers to actually sometimes force those changes in behaviour um, I think it's a, a huge and wicked problem and as a as a mere wildlife vet I don't have that um, that area of expertise but um, it's certainly something that if we go to make progress, we can't ignore because it is at the centre of pretty much everything, if you think about it. So, Glenn? And, and I wonder if you yeah. reflect on the risks that zoos um, pose as a mixing pot of pathogens between species that will never come into contact with each mm. other, but mm. certainly do. There certainly is, and um, as you know, there's there's good zoos and bad zoos. But even in the good zoos, um, uh, there's a not been enough attention on on the, the pathogen aspect. I think we're getting better. Um, I think it was really interesting, actually, um, just to put a, give an example around this. Was um, we've been doing some DRAs, disease risk analysis, with with Healesville. Um, over their endangered species and in that process of looking at one particular species which was the helmeted honey eater and how they manage them in a zoo they're off site off off exhibit but in aviaries and um, and it was realized that the biosecurity there actually wasn't good enough and we were um, they were there were there were risks from wild birds and while they were thinking about it in the main collection they weren't actually thinking it about it so much in their in their off-site collection, so um, you're right. It is a potential mixing point, and we need to do we need to do better. I think things are improving, and things like having a more disease risk um, analysis approach will only help that. Okay, I think I'm going to draw this to an end because we're we're out of time. Um, I'm sure Anna would be delighted to answer a few more questions up the front here, um, but I think uh, she's taken us on a tour across a rather a broad area of, uh, of uh, One Health and uh, given us some very specific examples. So please thank me and joining her for that.